Thanks, Anthony. Thanks, choir. Did you see that there? Okay. All right. So now it is our time for prayer. And that goes there. You come with me. All right. So um, let us offer our prayers, um, both spoken and silent, and I'd like to begin with a prayer uh, that was shared with me from the Book of Common Prayer, which is from the Church of England. O oh God, you made us in your own image and renewed us through Jesus, your Son. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love and work through our struggles and confusions to accomplish your purpose here on earth that in your good time, all nations and all races may serve you in harmony. Amen. And let us also continue to pray for our nation as we face the reality of persistent and institutional racism. Let's pray for the 440 million people infected by COVID-19 worldwide, 79 million of them here in our country, and the 953,000 people who have died to date and continue uh, to die in our country alone, so let us do our part to try and stay safe, uh, to give those frontline workers their chance to take care of us and hopefully to put this pandemic to bed uh, so that we can return to more normal lives. Um, so before we hit our sheet that has been printed, that is the yellow sheet, um, do you have any other prayers that you would like to offer before we hit these? Yes, Kathy. Yes, I would like to offer prayers for the family of Marty Brown, that's Lisa's aunt. She died this week, and uh, she's from Virginia. I believe the family's from Virginia, so we would like prayers for her family. Okay. Any other prayers? Is, um, I don't think Bobby F. is on here. Um, we'll pray for Bobby F., uh, the pharmacist from South Deerfield. A heart transplant recipient and now at home recovering. And so we'll offer prayers for Bobby. Any other prayers? Okay, then let's take out our yellow sheets. And please remember, we're just using first names. So let us pray for Alice, Alice Art, Art, Betsy, Bill, Bill Bonnie, Bonnie, Carrie, Charlene, Cindy, Denise, Denise Evelyn, Gary, and Lisa. Lisa. Jeff, Jimmy, John, Josh, Joshua, Karis, Lisa, Marty, Matthew, Melissa, Michael, Michelle, Prune and Mark, Richard and Sue, Cheryl, Steve, Thelma, Vinny, Virginia and Richard, Wes, Wink, the family of Ruth Kellogg, victims of violence everywhere in the world, those affected by natural disasters around the globe, and we pray for peace on earth. And may we, at this point, um, in the middle of our public worship, just turn inward for just a few moments to share with Jesus the things that we choose just to keep between God and ourselves. So just a few moments of silence. God of secret places, you know the hidden depths of our hearts and are acquainted with all of our ways. You know when the face that we present to the world is different from the one that we keep within us. Bring together our private conscience and our public image to build wholeness and holiness. Open to us the treasures of your word and, and make them the core value of our lives so that we may be blessed 
and so that our ministry may be pleasing in your sight and may also draw others to your reconciling love. Hear our prayers, both spoken and silent, sung and acted upon, like our donations for the people of Ukraine, as wide-ranging as for world peace and as near as the sighs that are too deep for words. Hear them and answer them as you alone know best. And these things we ask in Jesus' name, amen. And may we now share together the prayer that Jesus gave us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Anthony. secret rather than for show, so too we are invited to give without letting the left hand know what the right hand is doing. So when we bring our offering to church, we are responding to God's generosity already given to us. We're not trying to impress others, we're trying to show our thankfulness to God. Our offerings are treasures laid up in heaven, and through them we help to fund our church and its ministries, also to make a place available for us in our worship and our prayers. So we give according to the conditions in our life. So offerings may be sent directly here to the church, or there are collection plates at the different entrances to the church. And please know that your donations, your generosity, are very much appreciated. May we now stand, if you are able, as we share in the singing of the doxology. offerings that we now place in your sanctuary as a symbol of our represent and as a symbol of our love for you and for all others. May you use these gifts for your purposes we pray and these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now still standing let us share the reflecting hymn which is blue hymn number 200. What wondrous love is this? Oh, it's, I'm sorry what number? 257.
And today's gospel is taken from Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit to the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. And the devil said to Jesus, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, one does not live by bread alone. And then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all of the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to Jesus, To you I will give their glory and all of this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone whom I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you for to, uh, to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from Jesus for a more opportune time. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be accepted to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. On Ash Wednesday of all days, Sharon and I woke up to discover that our water heater had died. There were things that I needed to do because it was Ash Wednesday, but I also needed to wait to get the call back from the repair guys and then wait around for the repair guys to show up and sure enough, the guy shows up, doesn't have to part, so we still don't have hot water. He's got to come back the next day. You know, plus, with all of that, I didn't want to go out without taking a shower, and I really, really didn't want to take a cold water shower either. In the summer, you know, you look at me and you think this big, virile, tough guy. Uh, but I, in the summer, I don't go into a pool unless it's like 85 degrees. So I wasn't about to take a cold water shower in early March because that could have killed me. I could have died in my shower. So a little unexpected nuisance of a broken hot water heater changed all my plans for the day. It changed all my plans for Ash Wednesday. It changed all my plans for that first day of the season of Lent. And maybe in that, there was a Lenten message. Maybe it was an unnecessarily disruptive reminder that Lent is all about unexpected changes. We are journeying today with Jesus to the cross. And there is no way in the Old Testament that you could ever have come up with the idea that God would come into the world in a common baby, born in common circumstance, raised as a common child of Nazareth, becomes a carpenter, and then goes and gets baptized teaches for maybe two or three years, and after that he dies on a cross with nobody there to, to help support him. Nowhere would you ever have expected that story that is at the core of our Christian faith. Whether you are Protestant or Catholic or Orthodox, the cross is our unifying symbol. That is everywhere. That is the, that's the basis of our faith, the cross. And nobody expected it. No one expected it. it would have been blasphemous to come up with that message until Jesus lived it. And so it's an unexpected message. And we've got to remember that Jesus is a faithful Jewish man. So all the things that he is thinking about, you know, when he's thinking about God, you know, he's got a special relationship with God for sure, but he's still very human. 
and he's very Jewish, and he's got these expectations of what God would want a special Messiah, a special son of God to do, and just none of that jives with that. And so Jesus is also tormented, and he is on his own journey. Just like I was trying to tell the children that 40 days is a symbol from Noah and Moses, and now from Jesus' life, this is a time of hard preparation to begin something new. And so Lent is this path that we have just started. And when Jesus started to walk down the same path of unexpected revelation, it literally drove him out even further into the wilderness. John is in the wilderness. Jesus goes even deeper into the wilderness for a time of soul-searching introspection. And I choose those words intentionally, soul-searching introspection. You know, every first Sunday of Lent, we always begin with one of the, the gospel accounts of Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness. And, and those 40 days of Jesus are the primary reason for our 40 days today. And now, I read the Bible every day. I, but I don't read it for the details. I'm not like going to go on some Jeopardy show and win that, you know, by knowing Bible trivia. I read the Bible for the message. I read it, like I said, every single day. It's the single most important book in my life. And during Lent, I, I post a daily Lenten blog on our Facebook page, and it's based on the ecumenical lectionary of Bible readings for every single day of the year. And if you do those daily readings, it'll take you through the entire Bible in one year. And so the Bible is, in my sense, um, my, my prayer time with God. There's people that came in here uh, during those lunch hours this past week, um, and some of them had shared stories with me. Uh, and they come in, and they can even, like, you know, listen to themselves breathe, and, and they kind of get into this meditative uh, spirit, and, they, and they, they feel closer to God that way. And if they can do that, God bless them. Wonderful. Everybody goes to God in their own ways. That's not how I can get to God. I, I don't have, I'm not built that way. My continuing conversation with God is the still speaking word of God. The Bible is my prayer time with God. And so like I said, that, that first message every year at the beginning of Lent is this 40 days of Jesus in the wilderness. And when I'm reading those stories, you need to go for the meaning. You don't really have, I don't think you need to stick with all of the details. And I think one of the details from literally 2,000 years ago, that's the way they thought 2,000 years ago, is this idea of devils and Satan running around. And, and I think that this is much more profound than Jesus fighting a devil who can like literally pick him up and take him all over the world, you know, from here on this mountain to here on the temple, you know, he can just like pick up Jesus and take him around. I think that's the mindset of 2,000 years ago. I think instead there's something much more profound and meaningful for us going on in the mind and the spirit of Jesus himself that we can touch and experience. So everything happens at that unexpected moment of the baptism. Jesus leaves Nazareth as a carpenter. Maybe he goes down, he's thinking for a little while to John the Baptist. And, and then I, after I go to John, maybe I'll come back. Je Jesus is searching for something. And he goes down to John, and John is preaching all this hellfire and brimstone. You know, who warned you to flee the wrath that is to come, you brood of vipers? And John is out there, you know, spewing all this message of, you know, the chaff God is going to burn with an unquenchable fire. And Jesus is sitting there and listening, and he's taking it in because he accepts John's baptism. But I think Jesus is still searching because once he is baptized in that river Jordan, Something happens, a revelation to Jesus happens. And Jesus realizes that there's still something more. And he has this revelation that this is my beloved son. How do you process that you are God's special, unique, beloved son? I'm sure, there, and we can't know what it was, but there is some kind of relationship that Jesus had with God that none of us can ever have because Jesus is God incarnate. But he's also fully human. So how does that two go together? And Jesus is wondering and fighting and wondering amongst himself, what does this mean to be God's beloved son? And when that just kind of flashes in that brilliance of revelation, the baptism, Jesus is so confused. The oldest gospel says he's driven out into the wilderness. He's driven there. And, and, and that's the idea also that the, the skies are torn apart. This is not like some kind of Zen moment of, of realization. This is scary. This, the heavens are torn apart and Jesus is driven into the wilderness. 
Who am I? He's asking. And I think that speaks to me a lot more than devils picking up Jesus and transporting him around the world and putting him here and putting him there. This idea of the spiritual quest for who am I in God's eyes. And so the first test is this easy one, which is also the hardest one, I think. He hasn't eaten basically much for 40 days. And so if you are the Son of God, Jesus wanted, if I am the Son of God, well, I can do whatever I want. Remember Mel Brooks, it's good to be the king. Well, I can do whatever I want. I'm hungry. That's not food, but I'll turn it into food. And then if you are thinking even broader terms, if I am the Son of God, well, heck, no one has to be hungry. If I can turn all the rocks into all the bread, no one has to be hungry, and I can take care of everybody's needs, everyone's needs. And so Jesus is tempted with that kind of messiahship. And then he has to realize, that's not what I came into the world to do. We can feed everybody. We just have to give a little bit less to ourselves sometimes, a little bit more to someone who has nothing. So we can do these things. So it's not about proving that God is good. It's about proving that we can be better. So Jesus says, that's not going to get me to where I need to go. The second test is this one is really hard. Because Jesus is saying, brought up in this whole idea that you know, the Messiah is going to come with a sword in his hand. He is David's son. He is going to fight for right. He is going to set the people of God free. He's going to protect the people of God. And so I'll give you all of these kingdoms. All you have to do is bow down to me, which is power and prestige and authority. And Jesus says, I can't do that either because I can't force people to understand what it means to love. I can scare you into loving, I can force you into loving, or acting like you love, or seeming like you love, but there's nothing changing in here. So Jesus says, I can't do that either. So now Jesus has kind of realized, okay, I've got this strange new ministry. And so the last one is that temptation about taking you way up on a temple and jumping off. What if I have a real showy kind of ministry where I got miracles coming out here and there and everywhere, and people will say, wow, look at Jesus, he must be from God. No, there's actually a passage in the Bible where the Pharisees come up to him and they say, if we have some proof from heaven that you're the Son of God, we'll follow you. So it would have been easy for Jesus to jump, you know, figuratively off the temple and float down to earth. But Jesus says, you know, that may impress people, doesn't necessarily change people, but all the people that did witness his miracles, they were, wow, but who was at the cross? Mark says no one is there. So that's not going to do it either. So Jesus has to push against the current of this expectation of a, of a, you know, like John the Baptist, this fire and brimstone, this idea of David's son of a holy sword, Messiah. He's got to give this whole new message with nothing but gospel and example. So that's what we have to do. We have to try to come into this idea of gospel and example and let it change us. And Lent is disruptive because it grabs us by the shoulder and it shakes us because we can't be just like casual Christians during Lent. That says we have to be Christians during Lent. That means we have to follow an unexpected savior to an unexpected cross, and no one expected that. So as we begin our Lenten journey, once again this year, we read the 40 days in the wilderness, let us be prepared and open to an unexpected Jesus. You know, faith in general, but especially during Lent, is not meant to be a nice pat on the head. It's supposed to be a kick in the derriere. It's supposed to get us moving, to get us on the path to being a better Christian. And it's not easy to be a Christian. It's gonna cost a lot. And that is another unexpected revelation in our day and age. It's gonna take trust. What Jenny read up here for us is the message from Deuteronomy of giving first fruits to God. And the idea of first fruits is that the cupboard is bare. You know, the stocks of the winter are almost gone. Now the first fruits come in, and that could be fed to my family. But God says, take some of that first fruits and give it to me. He's saying, trust in me, even when it doesn't make sense. The first fruits, there's nothing in the cupboard. There are the first fruits. Give some to me. Trust in God, he is saying. He's been saying that for 3,000 years in the Bible. So this is God asking us to trust in him. And during Lent, we have to trust in a crucified Savior who would seem to you know, really the, you know, that seems to be the emblem of failure. You know, dying as a crucified thief or insurrectionist under the Roman Empire. 
But that cross is also the epitome of God's revelation. So let us journey with Jesus these 40 days to try and trust more in God and to help give us the strength for that journey. Let us now gather at Jesus' communion table with him and with each other so we can find the spiritual nourishment to follow Jesus on this Lenten journey. In his name we pray, amen. And I do believe you all have another bulletin insert for communion. And you also have those little packets uh, for communion as well. And hopefully, um, as things hopefully continue to uh, progress with the COVID, maybe we can get back to the uh, traditional mode of communion uh, because those individual packets are great um, in times of need, uh, but really that, that message of sharing the same, the same uh, that's a powerful message uh, that hopefully we can return to soon. So this table is for all Christians who wish to know the presence of Christ and to share in the community of God's people. The gospel tells us that on the first day of the week, Jesus was raised from death, appeared to Mary Magdalene, and that same day sat at the table with two disciples and was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the joyous feast of the people of God. Women and men, youth and children, who are in the rock, gather around our heart's table. But this table is for all people who wish to know the presence of Christ and to share in the community of God's people. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God the Most High. We give you thanks, God of majesty and mercy, for the beauty and the bounty of the earth and for the vision of the day, when sharing by all will mean scarcity for none. We rejoice that you call the entire human family to this table of sacrifice and love. We come in remembrance and celebration of the gift of Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be the good news. Born of Mary, our sister in faith, Christ lived among us to reveal the light and life of your grace, to suffer on the cross for us, to be raised from death, and then to live in glory. We bless you, gracious God, for the presence of your Holy Spirit in the church among us, and with your daughters and sons of faith, in all times, all places, we praise you with joy by saying, Holy, Holy, Holy God, God of love and majesty, the whole universe speaks of your glory, O God, the most high. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of our God, Hosanna in the highest. We remember that on the night of his betrayal and desertion, that Jesus took bread, gave you thanks, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Ministering to you in Christ's name, I share with you the bread. In the same way, Jesus also took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup of my salvation. <clears throat> this is the cup of salvation. All of you take and drink of this, for this is my blood. Sharing with you the cup of salvation, I share with you the blood of Jesus. Let us now share in the prayer of thanksgiving. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the gift of our Savior's presence and the simplicity and splendor of this holy meal. Unite us with all who are fed by Christ's body and blood, who may faithfully proclaim the good news of your love, and that your universal church may be a rainbow of hope in an uncertain world. In Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. And as, 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 as is our tradition, let us now share the closing imprinted in your bulletin of Shalom to you now.
you again for coming out today and joining us in worship on our first Sunday of Lent. And I do hope that maybe you'll think about joining us Tuesday for Bible or Wednesday for our Lenten discussion, which will be led by Reverend Cheryl, who is the uh, bridge pastor right now in uh, Conway. And that'll be in person in Hatfield or via Zoom. And that link will be sent out by Judy, um, or maybe it already has been. I'm not sure. Judy, has it gone out yet? No, okay, so it'll be going out from Judy at some point, so just keep your eye open for your, uh, in your email box for uh, the link for Wednesday evening. For our benediction, as we leave this sanctuary, reminded of the perfect love of Christ for all people, saint and sinner alike, let us carry the holiness of communion into our daily lives. Let us walk the path that Jesus has trod before us. Let us be bold in living our faith, knowing that this is where we will find Jesus. We prepare ourselves to approach the cross of his perfect love. We appreciate the cost of our salvation to God. And we see in Jesus' sacrifice the gift of hope and of renewal. Strengthened against all temptations, let us now go forth to love and to serve the Lord. Amen.